Hallelujah. We are still energized, inspired, and waiting for the next session. Okay, we'd like to acknowledge a very special group of guests we have here. In the morning when we acknowledged them, the pastor was not here to shake their hand. So we're just welcoming those who uh, we had. In the morning we had three guests who are non-Adventists and they had come with us. Pastor would like to welcome you to Nairobi Central in a special way. So if you could just lift up your hand one more time. Oh, they left at lunchtime. Hope, oh, yes, Karibu Sana. Um, another hand. Thank you, and um, welcome to Nairobi Central. Visitors, join us, get in touch so you know the next events we have for AYP that can be a blessing to you because we are blessed by your presence. I'd like to invite you to this afternoon session, Faithful Public Service, and we have our panelists are ready. I will introduce the moderator of the session, and then he's going to introduce these giant professionals who've served the public service, they've mentored, they've done everything, and they're going strong. I was very humbled um, that they all arrived well, well, well in good time before their time was here. So they're still going strong, and we want to learn the secrets of serving for many, many years and still going strong. So allow me to invite to um, introduce Brother Steve Ngolo. Brother Steve is an accomplished tax professional he works as a revenue officer, as, uh, working as a systems administrator in the commissioner's office, customs and border control department at the Kenya Revenue Authority. He's responsible for tax law, regulations, and enforcement, specifically within the ESC. His area of specialization is the World Trade Organization Agreements and World Customs Organization Guidelines. Steve is an accomplished speaker in both public and private forums. He is a speaker and a coach. He works with teens, mentoring teens, a program on development of skills, of life skills. Steve holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Nairobi. He's a postgraduate diploma in tax and customs administration from the Kenya School of Revenue Administration. And he also holds an MSc in finance from JKU Art. Currently, he's finalizing on his MBA. He is married to Bella Ngolo, and they have two children, Howie and Mo. He is a member in good standing of Nairobi Central SDA Church. So I'd like to welcome Steve. Steve, please introduce this giant professionals and take it up from there. Enjoy the session. So much. Right. Thank you so much, um, the chair and the convener of this great meeting that you're having today. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to greet you all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to this session. It's a session that I want to believe we are going to gain much, just like we've gained in other sessions. If you look at the panelists seated here with me, are seasoned public servants who have got great experiences and they are so much willing to share with us today. And so allow me to welcome you in a big way and a great way to this afternoon session where we are looking at faithful public service. That is going to be our main, main area of concentration. And when you're talking about public service, we are looking at service that is rendered in the public interest, intended to address specific needs pertaining to the aggregate 
members of a community. Mostly, we, when we talk of public <coughs> service, we are looking at a governmental employment body, civil um, service, and how we offer it. And so we are going to delve much into it and just find more. How can we honor God in such? And so our focus today is going to be honoring God with our professions, excellence in public service and as a mission ground, and parenting or mentoring faithful professionals. So yes, up here, I have a team of mentors who are going to do us great justice. Allow me to reflect us into the verse that we are looking at today. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 23 to 24, the word of God says, whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever kind of work you are doing, work heartily with all your heart and all the different ways that plays out in scripture with Christ. And not just with Christ, but with Christ-like character, with honesty, with diligence, with integrity, with humility, and so work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And so whatever we are, Paul admonishes us from the book of Colossians that whatever we find to do, do it like you are doing it unto God and not unto men. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Young Professionals Convention. I will be your host. My name is Steve Ngolo. I'm a member of this church. I'm married. I have two children, like it has been mentioned. Um, and we thank God that we can have this convention going on today. Um, I know there are so many people that maybe knows me and I know, and there are those that we invited. Uh, my sister Linda is here, who is a HR professional, and of course myriads of friends that are also here with me and with us today. So allow me in a special way to introduce our panelists that we are having um, this afternoon. Now, from Calvary Church, the conveners brought us a very powerful speaker and a professional, who is a professor of genetics, PhD from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, way back in 1993. She is a dynamic scholar, trainer, manager, who is widely published in her area of medical genetics, and more recently, bioethics. Her current focus, ladies and gentlemen, is application of research findings and advances in science for the promotion and protection of human rights. Our panelists today, to my right, um, has worked in various public and private research institutions and universities, and is currently a commissioner with the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. She previously served as the vice chancellor of AMREF International University, um, Prior to that, she was the Deputy Vice-Chancellor in charge of planning, research, and development at the University of Kabianga, or Kabianga University. Having been the Director, uh, Institute of Tropical Medicine and in, uh, Infectious Diseases at the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. In addition, she has been involved in many international and national government activities in various agencies. Uh, institutions and committees and, of course, task forces. In 2001, the President of the Republic of Kenya awarded this mother of two adult children with the elder of the honor of the burning spear, what we call EBS, in recognition for her service to the nation. She has a personal motto, what's worth doing is worth doing well. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for uh, Professor Marion Wanjiku Mutugi. <laughs> Asante sana. Uh, before I introduce my next panelist, Prof, there's a book you've co-authored with uh, Justice Lenaola, that is the judge of the Supreme Court, addressing ethical issues in law and medicine. Uh, that is looking at legal issues in the medical industry and how some of them raise ethical questions. Would you mind telling us a little about this book before I introduce my next panelist? Thank you very much. 
for the kind introduction. Yes, uh, this is one of the books that uh, I have been involved in writing. Ethics is what is right, what is acceptable, what is in a particular community. Ethics is dynamic. It differs from one place to the other. For example, the LGBTQ issue that we are dealing with is an ethical issue. FGM is an ethical issue. From one community to another, it differs what is right or wrong. The law is simply what is stated and is written. And there is a convergence, especially in medicine, in uh, practice of medicine, for example, issues where doctors ask you, can we take your patient to ICU? It's a terminally ill patient. If we keep them in ICU, we'll buy maybe another two weeks. If we leave them on the ward bed, it will be probably tomorrow. That's an ethical question. There is also the law. It also deals with medical research where we keep on hearing that Africans and low income countries, people there are vulnerable. That is where drugs are tested. That is where the drugs that are not accepted elsewhere are sold. That's an ethical question. Mm -hmm. So that's what we wrote about. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank uh, you so much. That's a, a book, the copy of the book up there, uh -huh. and you can get it at Textbook Center. Great. The book is available on the shelves. Textbook and it's not science. Center. It's easily written, you'll understand. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Great, thank you so much. Actually, I've been wondering where law and medicine comes in, but I think as we delve into the discussion more, we'll find much. Thank you so much, Professor Marion. Please, a round of applause one more time for her. Asante Sana. To my left uh, is one face that I know is quite familiar with most of you. Members of this church, he's a member of this church, of course, an elder here, and I know those who are not members, you may have or you must have seen him even in the media and everywhere else. From Gesusu Primary School, deep down Kisi, right? We call it Gesusu Ward in Kisi County, to the world. That is my guest to my left. His education background touches on the University of Nairobi, Royal College of Physicians in UK, Edinburgh University, I think that's where they met with the prof here, University of London, University of Bombay, University of New Delhi, Bugema Missionary College, and amongst many other. And that qualifies him to be a great scholar in the Republic of Kenya. He's a medical doctor of health, a lecturer and a professor at the University of Nairobi. In 1992 to 1997, he was appointed permanent representative Kenya mission to the United Nations Environmental Program, where he defended the establishment, where he defended the permanent location of UNEP in Nairobi. At the national level, he ensured the establishment of National Environmental Management Authority, what we call NEMA, to help coordinate, supervise the implementations of limited environmental laws in the country to avoid taking conflicting actions on various environmental matters. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is also a seasoned politician. He's a four-time elected member, not nominated, elected member of parliament, a three-term MP for Nyaribari Masaba constituency and Kisi County as a senator from the year 2017 to 2022. He got many ministerial appointments. He has served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs in March 2012 to 2013, where he supervised the implementation of the Kenya foreign policy in general and strengthened and promoted bilateral, multilateral and international political, economic, and other relations. He served as a Minister for Education 2008 to 2012, where he spearheaded, listen to this, the introduction of free secondary school education system. He also served as the Minister for Health in the year 2001 to 2002. And here he developed the level five hospitals in the country. In the year 1997 to 2001, he served as the Minister for Local 
government. And in that portfolio, he reorganized the local government operations. When, before most of us or some of you were born, he also served as the Minister for Technical Training and Applied Technology. And that's where he did set up the ministry from the scratch. His love for God is immeasurable. He is married, and I've seen Mrs. Professor in the congregation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me. And mom is at the back. Yes, there. she's at the back. And mom, just wave now that you're there. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is Mrs. Ongeri. Please give a round of applause. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our guest today, Honorable Ambassador, Professor Samson Kegengo Ongeri. <laughs> Prof, you have so many titles. <laughs> so many. And you have so many honors, some of which include member of the Royal College of Physicians, you have a medical pin from the IAAF, that is International Association of Athletics Federation. You are given the Order of the Elder of the Golden Heart, EGH. You have the Elder of the Order of the Burning Spear, EBS, dating back to 1984. You are a member of the Serena Peace Talk. That is in 2008 to date. And uh, again, you are the chairman of Ongeri Foundation. This honors, Prof, which one is most significant and still gives you great money? <laughs> They're quite a million. <laughs> well, I think the most important aspect of it, thank you for the introduction. I think what is behind all these achievements mm. is the spirit to work and the spirit to achieve and achieve beyond all means beyond the means. And, uh, and behind it lies the humility, the integrity, the sense of purpose and direction, and you want what you want to achieve and how you want that to take direction for the common good of society. I think I can, I can simply summarize all those areas into one, one element, service to humanity and service to God as a, as, a, as a penultimate price that all of us must pay. Thank you. Wow, please, a round of applause for Prof. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. And uh, Professor Ungeri and Professor Mutugi, we are so much humbled to have you here. We just want to delve straight into our panel discussion and I want to promise you it's going to be an interesting one because, um, like I told you, I have gray-haired people full of wisdom up here. Let me start with you, uh, Professor Ungeri. History has it that uh, you are noticed by the second president of the Republic of Kenya, President Daniel Moy, when you're part of the organizing committee for the 1987 um, all African Games. Uh, let me ask you, I have three questions on this. How did, uh, how did you put yourself or place yourself to be noticed by the president? Uh, let me put it this way simply, that uh, the first recognition by President Moy came in 1960. <laughs> you know, they are laughing because some of them... When he was the parliamentary secretary for education, yes. and I was then at the University of Delhi, and I was a student leader, and I came to Kenya, uh, leading the Kenya delegation, because I was the president of the Kenya Students Association, I was also the president of the... Uh, secretary general of the all Africa Students Association in India. And we were in that inaugural flight. And we went to see him. And one of the things we demanded from him was that we wanted to see him, say, Jomo Kenyatta at Kapenguria and, uh, and, uh, and argue for his release. That's the first time he noticed me. The second time he noticed me is 1966, after I qualified as a 
Doctor of Medicine and Doctor of, uh, Bachelor of Surgery and Bachelor of Medicine from uh, Bombay University and I'd come to Nairobi and I was an intern and I was uh, on call at the casualty in Kenyatta National Hospital. His driver had an accident and he brought, he brought him to casualty and he came and he found me in attendance. And I attended to him and, uh, and, and he was very pleased. Later on he asked me, uh, you are a young African doctor. Can you be gracious enough to also look after my family? Uh, a request which I graciously accepted. And I did that for quite a number of years. So, so 1987 was the culmination of that recognition because then I had served as the chairman of Kenya Athletics Association in Kenya who were instrumental to developing the talent of all young athletes and professionals, the likes of uh, uh, Charles Asati, Nyamau, Ben Chipcho, all this group, and uh, Henry, Henry, uh, and Henry, who had conquered the world. And uh, one of the things I did was to be able to build the current Nyayo Stadium was built by Curtis of Kenya three years under my chairmanship. <laughs> and then we went with him to China in 1982, 83, 84. We managed to be able to get Kasarani Stadium. Mm. So 1987 <laughs> was a culmination uh, of many things that I had served in athletics. I was one of his members in the family, and uh, I was already a very a distinguished Kenyan doctor in the, in the profession, and therefore, I was the natural choice for organizing the All Africa Games in 1987, which was the fourth edition here in Nairobi. I, 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 love, I love the beat. Being a natural choice. Yes. <laughs> You know, you know, Prof has brought us back to when he was an intern. So it's very important as a young professional to get yourself at a position where you become a natural choice. Okay? I want you to get that on Professor Mutugim. Let me just um, bring you in. Um, one life functions of the Kenya National Human Rights and Equality Commission, where you serve, is to promote the protection and the observance of human rights, especially in public and private institutions. Uh, as a young lady, um, bring in your early years in public service. When you're making debut at public service, what were some of the challenges? And should we take it natural to face challenges, especially uh, the young ladies here, the young professionals? Thank you very much. I'll start where my good professor, he's my father. Yes. Mrs. Ongeri went to school with my mother. She's my mom. Okay. So I am privileged to be sitting with my parents here. I'll start where he left. You must be the natural choice. You ought to put your cards on the table so that you are well known. And well known means that it is clear what you can and what you cannot do. I'll repeat, it must be clear what you can and cannot do. So, uh, when you look at uh, being a young woman, what comes to your mind is sexual harassment, sexual advances. My take is that every girl wants to be admired. It is actually abnormal if nobody looks at you and turns your head, you wonder what is wrong with me. Mm -hmm. But when it goes beyond there, maybe it can go into sexual <coughs> harassment. Yes, I have faced face, face sexual harassment. My very first sexual harassment was when I applied for my first job. And I got the job fair and square, I got a call, come for your letter. 
So I went in and I met this man who sat on the panel and he said, you know, I was on the panel. Niliongea mambo mazuri juu yako. I really, really push for you. Now I want you, he's straight, straight. Now I want you and me to go and celebrate. So I looked at him. I was a young girl. I think I was 20 something. I looked at him. At first he didn't click what he was saying. He says, yes, I want us to go to a nice hotel and with a glass of wine celebrate. I looked at him and I said, you know, I want, to, I want this job. But I want to get it knowing that I deserve it, not because you talked on my behalf. I took the letter, I put it on his desk, I walked out. I did not take that job. I did not go back. The Lord gave me another better job. The second case of sexual harassment is when I was doing my PhD in the University of Edinburgh. And my supervisor kept on making sly remarks. I was wiser then, so I could understand what he was saying. And I kept on <laughs> avoiding until one day he figured out I'm a bit stupid, so he needs to put it clearly. I was working in a lab, and I was working with some delicate things, some agarose gel, if you know what that is. And I was holding it in my hand in a tray. And he came and says, look here, Marion, if you want your PhD hard enough, you are going to talk to me nicely. I looked at the gel. I wanted to throw it in his face. By God's grace, I threw it on the floor. Pop! <laughs> and I walked out and I told him, I don't want that PhD. You can keep it. I went home and I wondered, what did I do? The following day, I went to work as if nothing had happened to the lab. And the boss in the institution called me. And he said, come, let's go and have tea. He was an old umze. He says, Marion, don't worry about that man. He's a sex pest. Treat him like a pest that he is. Throughout my life, right now I am 64. I'm widowed. You didn't believe. People still make passes at me. But I'm wiser. <laughs> I'm wiser, I don't do such stupid things anymore. <laughs> Some of them, I look in their face, I say, what, are you sure? And they get embarrassed. Others, I laugh in their face and I say, oh, you must be joking, there must be young girls who you can go out with, just leave me alone. You know, I have different strategies for dealing with it. But yes, you will find these things and they will happen. But to me, as Prof has said, you must be, the, you must be clear. People must be clear from the word go what you can and what you cannot do. Wow. They will try because men like trying. They will try, but they must be clear what you can and what you cannot do. Yeah, Prof, I, I think, um, <laughs> I, I, I think another thing, even ladies keep trying, okay? So men, <laughs> men you're protected also. Not and in our generation, maybe <laughs> this one. <laughs> so, so of, of course, it's possible to be a Joseph in a Potiphar's house. Especially the promotions and all that, there are always temptations that come away. But like Prof, uh, Prof is saying, she has grown wiser. You also, we need to be wiser even as we move on. Um, let, me, let me get to um, Professor Ungeri. Prof, at one point, um, you served this republic as a minister for technical training and applied technology. That was in 1988 to 1992. And you championed the Juakali sector. Is Juakali only meant for self-employment? Um, or is it there, uh, uh, I mean, is there a place for the artisans in public service? Maybe you tie it down with this question. Is it okay to venture into technical trades uh, once, you're in, uh, once you're a public servant? Thank you very much, Steve. A very interesting question, and I shall intend to give an interesting answer. <laughs> During 1988, you remember that was immediately after the All Africa Games when I ventured into politics, and I won and I was appointed to a ministry which has, had never been created in this country mm. at that time. And I remember going to Jogo House B 
with a desk, with the late my permanent secretary hereby, and the brief from the president was very clear that we needed to create employment opportunities for our young people, for our generation, and therefore we need to run away from the vertical type of education, from the primary KCP copy at that time, KCP now, uh, to the secondary, to the university, and those who, way, who fall by the wayside have nowhere to go. So I have three responsibilities to cut out. The first responsibility is, first of all, to create the structure and the policy of, uh, of that ministry. Mm -hmm. So I then ventured to bring into parliament a session of paper, number one of 1988, to be able to articulate what the vocational and technical training issue should be. That was one. And I successfully carried it out to, through parliament and became a policy for that country. Mm -hmm. Now, what did the policy entail? That we now were arguing that we must have a curriculum. Before then, they were just getting certificates that you, you are an artisan or you are uh, a certificate or without any certification whatsoever. So I brought in the framework of qualification for certification of vocational and technical training, which meant literally sitting down and developing the curriculum, which would then fit at various levels of educational standards. And that started with the youth polytechnics, where you will get a simple certification. Then you go to the middle level colleges. At that time, there were seven uh, technical training institutes that have been established on a Rambe basis. We now formalize them to be run by the government. And therefore, we develop a second tier level of technical training institute where you would get a diploma. And then, of course, the National Polytechnics. That time was only Nairobi Polytechnic, which is now the Polytechnic University of Nairobi. We also developed a curriculum to be able to venture into that place. Uh, and th those who qualify from youth polytechnic will also have the opportunity to go vertically mm -hmm. to a middle level technical training institutes, and then finally to a national polytechnic. And if need be, we need to establish the uh, technical universities. That's how Moe uh, Eldred came up as part of the technical university, Puani Technical University, and the Nairobi the Polytechnic now that we have here at the university, yeah. the one just next to the railway station. Mm. So I was able to put into place all those. The third element that pushed me into this ministry was that that time, the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, had frozen aid to Kenya mm. because they wanted us to follow a particular pattern that they had established. And, and, and President Moore at that time said, nothing doing, we need to create some opportunities for our young people to grow and to nurture their interests. So what was then, the Juakali became the highest employer. When the Britain Goods institutions withdrew their aid to Kenya, Juakali was able to employ 40%. And I didn't leave it there. I said, it's no good being a Juakali, an artisan, then we must be able to access you to credit mm -hmm. so that you can be able to start your own business. And therefore, later on, it was interesting, in 1984, uh, before then, I was the chairman of Kenya Industrial Estate appointed as a chairman because having been a minister for technical training. And this is what it meant that you have to do skill upgrading for the young people, those who have a certificate, but they don't have the skills that they can be able to venture into a private practice or set up their own micro enterprises. Therefore, you needed to give them that skill upgrading. So I took then what was called the DIT, Director of Industrial Training in Nairobi, which was under the Ministry of Labor. It was brought under my Ministry of Technical Training and Applied Technology. Uh, and we were able to now give skills to all the artisans, the diploma holders, and the higher diploma holders, 
And that's how we drove some of these investors from Biashara Street, from Moy Street to industrial area. So they were able, before then it was a taboo to say that you are in your Akali. It now became fashionable for all civil servants to say, after they have retired, that I'm going to do my Juakali business. Wow. So we sanitized <laughs> Juakali uh. from a relegated uh, profession to a very admirable profession. And today, I can say every one of us is in Juakali. Wow. Yeah, and, and uh, so we are not, as young professionals, what Prof is trying to bring about is that we are not sitting pretty to wait for a white collar job. We can always find something to do. And if we have siblings who have not made it to the university or where to put them in a place where they can get into a tie and get into an office, we can empower them through the technical colleges that were set up. I'm proud in the reign of Professor Ongeri. Thank you so much, Prof. Let me, let me come to Professor Marion. Before I ask you this question, please, you can put your questions down in a paper. I'll give you time to belt them out for the panelists to answer. Uh, the conveners, you'll guide me on time, because I think we have been robbed a lot of time anyway. <laughs> All right, uh, Prof, uh, Professor Marion Mutugi, you're both PhD holders. Um, I'm not yet there, but now that I'm seated with you, I think I'm the third one here. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if, if I may ask, how is education up to PhD level an enabler to excellence in public service? And, and with, with, with uh, the young professionals that you're seeing here, uh, the educational qualifications intact and in place, how should one prepare for excellence? in public service, physically, mentally, and even spiritually. Thank you very much. I have taught in universities for over 20 years. And so, Nataka Biasharangu Yendele, so please do PhDs. <laughs> but having said that, a PhD, in my view, is not about content. Having done one myself and having supervised more than 30 PhD students, I believe that a PhD is about resilience, hard work, patience, perseverance, humility, those soft skills. It's not about content. It's about character development because a PhD drives you to the wall until you wonder whether it's worth it. And so, Yes, a PhD is important, Very. particularly if you are in, particular, in areas that they require it for career progression. In academia, you are not an academic until you have a PhD. So it depends what area you are in. But just remember that a PhD is about character development where you have worked so hard, but people look at you in the face and tell you this is rubbish. And you have to swallow humble pie and go and redo it and write, rewrite what you had written, the way you had written it before and they had said rubbish before, you repeat. So um, that's my view. And uh, in terms of enabling uh, in public, uh, uh, ex, uh, en as an enabler, I think uh, that uh, Title opens doors. It does open doors. But as young professionals, I think what is important, preparation for public or even private service, is about knowing where you want to go. We have heard about strategic planning. Do you have a, a personal strategic plan? How many of you have? Personal strategic a personal plan. strategic plan. So you are just in a float mode <laughs> because you have worked on organizational strategic plans. A strategic plan shows you where you want to go and how to get there. So if you do not know in your career where you want to go, then any road will take you there. For example, if you, if you record in the previous panel, excellent panel that was here. 
They talked about what is your purpose in life. Mm. What do you want to achieve? At the end of the day, what would you want to have had in your hand? If it's money, please don't go to public service unless you want to steal. You won't get it there. <laughs> so you, 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 you can get the money in the private sector, you can get the money in business, but you will not get it in the public service. So you need to know what you want in life. For example, you need to ask yourself, at the end of the day, economically, where do I want to be? Assuming the end of day is the 70 years that are set in the Bible. You may go beyond, it's fine. But in terms of what do you want? Do you want a mortgage-free house, one? Do you want yours and one for each of your five children? What do you really want to get at the end of the day? Or are you in a rat race where you just keep on getting more and more and more and you don't have an end point? In terms of money, how much money do you want? How much money is enough? Now, I may be talking theoretically, but uh, we had this conversation with my late husband very early in life. And we figured out how much we would want. We would want a house which is ours. We decided we maybe want another one where we can get rent from when we grow old. And we decided if God gave us children, they could get these things, but we are not going to work for these children. We are not going to work for these children. We are going to educate them, we are going to give them food, we are going to give them clothing, but we are not going to work for them. Please, we are not bad people. <laughs> but we decided our focus was not to get property for our children. It was to give them, enable them as much as we can, but we were not going to be break our backs to buy them a house, to buy them one, this one and that one and our life has been fairly comfortable. We don't have much, but we have enough, and our children have gone to school, and they're still going to school. As long as you want to study, we will pay. So have your own strategic plan. How much is enough? At the end of the day, when can you say, fine, I've accomplished it? I'm comfortable. I am comfortable. I have accomplished what I set to do. What have you set to do? If you do not have your own strategic plan, and the Bible says, present your plans before the Lord and you bring them to pass. So if you have no plan, what are you presenting to God? <laughs> so I challenge you to think through your personal strategic plan. And in that personal strategic plan, one of the most important considerations in my view is a spouse. Other than God, the wife or the husband you have will influence your life most. So please, in your strategic plan, also put qualifications for the wife or the husband you are looking for. Because they are really, really going to influence your life for or against your goals, for or against the kingdom of heaven. Have your personal strategic plan. Have you it's yours. If you don't like it, you can change it. It's yours. Thank you. <laughs> please, please, let's, let's clap for Prof. You know, such tit bits, especially the bit of, you're not going to work for your children. Prof, have you worked for your children? Uh, <laughs> in, in a minute. I have uh, four children, and uh, my wife, Liz, she's here. We agreed that uh, we'll educate them, and after that, they'll be on their own. Yes. And that's the right attitude. There you are. Because, young because, 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 because you cannot uh, expect you as a parent to nurture your children up to their adulthood. You educate them at the university, then they come hanging around you looking for more help. <laughs> and that's why God says, go and multiply. Thank you, thank you so much, bro. Uh, <laughs> well, God says go and multiply, wow. <laughs> All right, uh, young professionals, uh, we are young professionals. I hope there are no children expecting their parents to be working for them now, here. 
and uh, of importance, of course, the spouse, the wife of your youth, the husband of your youth. What are the strategic plans that you're having as early as now? Uh, let, me, let me come to uh, Prof. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Marion. Uh, let me come to Professor Ungeri. Uh, in the public service, you have served in various ministries uh, quite a lot, foreign affairs, education, health, local government, and of course, the technical training and applied technology that you mentioned. <coughs> What are some of the achievements um, that we can point out as young people, these people seated here, that that one was done by Professor Ongeri, who is an Adventist. What are some of these achievements that we can point at? And is there a significant way that you represented your, such, I mean your church in such high-profiled offices in the land? Uh, let me say this, Steve. Yes. If I were to enumerate what I was able to achieve, I don't think we'll be able to we'll be here until in, tomorrow in, morning. In three minutes. And I don't intend touch to. On a few. I don't <laughs> intend to do that. But one thing that sticks out quite clearly in my mind is when President Moy was giving out land, and then. He asked me, because now the relationship was quite close, uh, I would like to have a, a, a church that can develop a university yes. and be able to allow that university to take on the local population, even though they are from other churches. And it quickly came to my mind, and that time, the. The division was looking for land for the university. Mm. That's how Baraton University was born. That is Some of you might have been a beneficiary out of that one. Mm. Mm. Secondly, when I was the minister for health, we had a crisis in this country, just like we had a crisis of COVID-19 and there was an HIV pandemic. It came, and it was very difficult to be able to manage. People were perishing. But then I was the Minister for Health, and then the drugs were completely out of reach because they were intellectual property. They were patented drugs. I was able to persuade the President because I realized in the WTO, World Trade Organization, uh, section six of that uh, uh, regulation states that if a country is in an emergency, mm. you can be able to order for what you call generic drugs. And for us to be in that kind of state of emergency, I requested the president to convene a session of parliament in Mombasa. He was going away to Djibouti. And I told him the nearest place you can come to is Mombasa. So the whole parliament was summoned to Mombasa. We passed on that uh, uh, regulation. That gave me the opportunity to bring in the generic drugs, which were $1,000 at that time for treatment, and I brought them down to below $250. So that's one significant area. It brought a lot of change. And the preference rate of uh, HIV AIDS, which was uh, between uh, 20 to 30 percent, depending where you are from in Kenya, I was able to bring it down to below 10 percent. Today, it stands at about 5 percent. That is the program that I did. As a minister for local government, one of the things I noticed that when I did, I had the privilege and the authority to uh, say you can be given the land for doing this and that as a minister for local government. We were then using what we used to call CAP 265 of the Local Government Act. And most of the churches in Nairobi Mombasa, Kisumu, 
uh, Kisi in, in uh, Eldred, Rift Valley, and Nakuru were born, they are beneficiary of that uh, position I held. It's not only the seventh day that many people I give the plots, but I give to other churches. As the Minister for Health, when there was an, an opportunity during this HIV pandemic, I was able to distribute ambulances, and therefore Kindube became a beneficiary of the, of the, of the ambulance and Kapsawal, which is AIC uh, church. They became beneficiaries. As the Minister for Foreign Affairs, I was able to, no, Minister for Education. You know, all this e-learning that you are now techno-savvy today started, I'm the one who instituted the e-learning from grade two to grade seven, and from form one to form two, and set up the e-curriculum uh, through KICD that time. And we were able to develop those materials. And we were able to move, because at that time, the school learning, through KBC was very disjointed and you could not hear it was breaking up. So for the first time at the KICD, I was able to set up a digital transmission, transmission uh, station where the school learning was being transmitted and therefore the e-learning or e-materials uh, were being developed there. That's why you have the curriculum today. And, and I think that went very far away. Uh, when uh, at the Ministry of Education, it, I took over. This was in, uh, 2008 and 2011. Uh, uh, I took over when we had post election violence. Our schools were in chaos. You remember, students were burning dormitories. We were burning all the buildings and everything everywhere. And it's the first time I introduced what we call peace education in the curriculum. And you remember when that was introduced, there was some relative calmness in the schools and people settled down. I was also able to introduce in the curriculum and also as a policy, the nomadic education, the marginalized groups. We are seeing these problems today here. And uh, at that time, as, 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 as uh, ambassador for UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, uh, in uh, two, uh, 1992 to 1997, I negotiated all the conventions. And I'm glad you are, your conference is a convention. Mm. Let me tell you what the convention means, that where people come together and they must agree on a set of rules and things that must happen in a civilized society. Therefore, I was able to negotiate the framework on climate change, the one which is giving us headache now, and I was also the president of the multilateral fund, which was then looking at the ozone layer and the effects of ozone layer on the, on the land and on the climate. I also I was able to negotiate the biodiversity convention on all the biodiversities and the richness in that biodiversity, I negotiated the convention on desertification and with particularity with Africa and also on prior informed consent. Wow. In Habitat, as an ambassador for UN Habitat, the new urban agenda, the one which we are now using here for spatial planning and development, the one which gives prosperity and leave no one behind, the one which brings in a new uh, paradigm shift in how to handle the urban uh, uh, conglomeration, so that you don't set up uh, slums. Instead of setting up slums, you set up centers that are both ac economically active with all the services that are available within that zone, and the value of land is also enhanced. So as I said, if I continue enumerating, <laughs> but, so but the best thing I must say, <laughs> the best of all, of it all, when I was appointed to be a member of the panel 
or peace, peace talks mm -hmm. in Serena. This experience, I think I've told Pastor Rotich, they know about it, mm -hmm. Pastor Nyaga, mm -hmm. and many others. We went to County Hall. The first meeting with Kofi Annan, the international media was there, everybody was there, eminent persons, President Kikwete, President uh, from Tanzania, the other one who passed on, were there, and we wanted to start the meetings. Under normal rules, UN meetings, they never start with prayers. And so they started the meeting. The microphones failed. <laughs> they went for the second round. Wanted to start the meeting. The microphone failed. Then I got the courage. I said, let's on. Let's pray. They said, okay, you come and pray. <laughs> I stepped forward. And I took the microphone. And prayed. And prayed. And the miracle here, I don't know where the verse came from. Second Chronicles 7 verse 14. If my people who are called by my name mm -hmm. humble themselves, seek my face, and repent. I recited the whole verse. And the microphones were free. They brought, they brought in a Muslim. He had a free microphone. And the microphones were on. And the meeting started. From then on, all those sessions we had in Serena here, they were preceded by a prayer. You know, you know one, one thing... Um, my take home here is that if you are in a position of influence, please represent Jesus there. Yes. And that is, honestly, that is what Prof is saying here. When he's given an opportunity for land, he thinks of an Adventist university. When he's, and, and there is a confession that was given by President Kibaki sometimes back. Yes. That he knows SDA because of Professor Sam Ungeri. Who would not attend cabinet meetings on a Saturday? On that's nowadays, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. And that was it. And so, in every area of influence, please represent Jesus to the highest. Please, let's give a round of applause again. Um, <coughs> thank you. I'm running short of time, but I want us to take the next two questions, uh, Prof. Um, unless advised otherwise by the conveners. Or should we say until the audience starts looking at us badly? <laughs> All right, I'll take the, the last two questions. Oh, Elder Jeff is communicating. I'm soon getting the signal. Now, to Professor Marion. A few of your research projects uh, that was going through your document. Uh, by the way, you can Google the CV for these two amazing people. Even summarizing it is a problem but very deep and wealthy. And a few of the research projects you've done include support for young women affected by gender-based violence, care and support, scaling up um, art, use of adherence. Uh, you have also done a research project on capacity building uh, for forensics in respect to sexual violence, uh, genetic profiling of sex offenders, JKUR, that one you also did. Now, tell us something about uh, gender violence in public service. What form or what forms do gender violence take? Is it only sexual harassment or are there other forms of gender violence? Please. Thank you very much. Um, some of the work that you have quoted, in 1999, we lost a very close family member from HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. And I saw how that loss devastated our family. Because there was a lot of stigma associated with it, we could not even say what happened or what she died of. And uh, as the good professor has told us, ARVs were not available then. 
So being positive was a death sentence. Unfortunately, the church also stigmatized those who are positive. And uh, so I set up a community-based organization in my village. Mm. And uh, it was women-led. And uh, among the things it did was, all it did was community education. We got a little money from some donors here and there, but we went and talked about HIV and AIDS in the village. Interestingly, you know how it is easy to talk, especially I'm a biologist, I'm a geneticist, so I have no problem of calling genitals by their right name in English. Yeah. <laughs> but when it came to my mother tongue, it was a bit tight. So having to run those programs and people understanding that you did not get HIV from being a prostitute. You got HIV from having sex with somebody who had it, even if that person was your husband or your wife. And that it wasn't a death sentence. And that you could, if you were both positive, you could also have a negative child, a HIV negative child. So among other things that we did in that CBO was at the time that coffee and tea in my area, the prices had gone down. And so poverty, real poverty was coming in. Real poverty was coming in. And uh, we introduced tissue culture bananas, which were available and new varieties from Jomo Kenyatta University where I was working then. The most satisfying work that I have done is application of science to the end user. Domesticating science to the woman in the village, the man in the village, so that it can benefit them on a day-to-day -day basis. In genetics, genetics is a very high-profile profession. Many, many new things happen there. But the question is, do they actually apply to the local population? One of the other things that I have been involved in is DNA forensics. I can talk about this for many hours because this is my work. But suffice it to say that your DNA is unique to you. None of the other seven billion people in this world have the DNA like yours. It's unique to you. And this technology is available in criminal work. For example, in sexual violence, in rape, for example. Rape is usually a personal crime. It's only two people involved. So I say, you did it. You say, I did not. You did it. I did not. There are many people who are today incarcerated. They are in jail because they are convicted of rape and yet they did not do it. We know there are people who are there because some people agreed to frame them so that they can get their land or they can get even. And yet here is a tool. There are many rapists who are walking these streets, serial rapists, but there is this tool that can be used to say without fear or favor, definitively, it is you or it is not you. So we have worked on this and the Kenyan's Forensic Lab at the DCI has gone through different phases. And uh, some years ago, I walked to the DCI and said, I want to talk to you. Who are you? I say, my name is Professor Mutugi. I want to talk to you about DNA. Come in. I talked, I explained to him, it didn't happen. We got a new DCI. Again, I walked in. I said, I would like to see the DCI. Do you have an appointment? No, but I must talk to him. What about the security of this country? Walk in. <laughs> and I explained to him, this new DCI, 
I sat with him. I remember I got to his office. They said, wait, it was about three. He says, wait, I didn't get into his office until 7 p.m. I always carry my laptop or a book, so I was no, no hurry. I get, got into his office at seven, and I did not get out until 10 p.m. I explained to him step by step on how DNA can be used to make his work easy. He said what you have told me, he was writing notes, tell me, is it easy for me to take my police officers and make them geneticists or to take geneticists and make them police officers? <laughs> I told him in my view, it is easy to take graduates who have done biochemistry and genetics and bio biomedical sciences, recruit them as police officers, take them to Keganjo. And from there, it started moving. We got, he called his high-ranking officers. He says, tell these people about this. I said, please, I'll take you slowly. It's not complicated. We negotiated a partnership with the University of Leicester in the UK where DNA forensics was discovered. And his officers went there and got it. As we are talking today, there is a forensic lab at DCI. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I give that example not to show what I can do, that whatever you know, you are an expert. Be confident, be brave about it, go to the people who need to hear it, and be persistent, mm. and one day it's going to happen. Wow, amen. Thank you, thank you so much. And of course, don't, don't forget to pray even for the DCI, right? You prayed before going there. <laughs> By the way, the DCI was a staunch Catholic, yeah. So he had uh, his, uh, what do you call rosary. it? His rosary. Yeah. And he says, wait, 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 wait. I need to pray. When he finished, I said, you know, I'm not a Catholic, but if you allow me, I'll pray before I go home because it's 10 p.m. He says, do you want a policeman to escort you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, it, it, it's coming out that we can always have a contribution to the Republic in our areas of expertise. Usingangani in other people's areas, just there and where you are. Use it to promote uh, the peace and of course, give a high contribution um, in your area to the Republic of Kenya. Maybe the last question before I come to you, uh, dear audience, for the questions. Uh, Prof, it would be unkind to skip this. There is a guy here called Mokaya. Where is Mokaya? Mokaya just tries and Mokaya vied for senatorial seat in Yamira. He was beaten. <laughs> He's a very young man, a youth in this church. Mokaya, thank you. Just sit down. Just sit down. Don't give him the mic. I'll, I'll give him time uh, if at all he has question. I was just making him rise so that you see how, Prof, you see how some people are looking up to you <coughs> and they feel like they want to venture into politics. Uh, coming to politics, you served Nyaribari. Uh, it's uh, um, Nyaribari Masaba. Yeah? Uh, three terms. And then, of course, you are elected um, senator for Kisi. Um, that is in the last term of government. How and why did you venture into politics? Uh, very simple and straightforward. Yes. <laughs> In my profession, yes. I'd reach a level, I'm a child specialist, mm. I'm a nephrologist, I'm an immunologist. We share the same professional background with a, a Marion, Professor Marion, mm -hmm. Tugi. So at my level of research at the University of Nairobi, I'd reached where, instead of looking at the whole kidney, and the kidney diseases, and how they begin and how they end, uh, I was now looking at the cell membrane of the kidney. <laughs> and uh, I was looking at it this way, on the outside, what we call the epithelial side, I was saying how uh, the pus is being made to affect the kidney function. At the membrane side, I was looking at the membrane itself, how it was being affected in kidney diseases. Then inside the cell, I was looking at the lining of the cell, what we call the endothelial cell, uh, 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 how it was being affected. 
to cause kidney diseases. And then I would go and get chromium 51 and tag it along. Mm. Uh, it will fluoresce. So I'll use special micro, uh, microscopes, yes, fluorescing. fluorescing microscopes, to see the characteristics. They fluoresce, and you see the characteristics you see in the cell. So one day I asked myself, from a human being to a cell, and you are confined to the cell, <laughs> and you are completely unaware of what's going on outside the cell. Is this the kind of business I want to continue? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no. I told my wife, I want to go to politics. And I want to serve the whole human being. <laughs> not, not a cell. I want to serve society. <laughs> and this is after I had established all these dialysis machines. Mm -hmm. I was the first one to bring 10 machines to Kenyatta National Hospital to establish the dialysis. We were the first people to do the first kidney transplant. You remember that girl called Coco in this country? I said, I've done enough. If it's in the research, if it's in the sciences, I've done enough. But this science is now taking me to a cell and to a membrane. And uh, let me leave it there. Let me now go and serve community. community. That's what sparked me to politics. Wow. So you may reach, uh -huh. as young professionals, you may reach the zenith of your profession. There must be a calling somewhere else. Yes. You are being called to go. Yes. Now, now, I, <laughs> <laughs> now, now I understand. So that into politics. I don't understand how much you're a politician. This small thing you've called membrane cell, yeah. you've brought the whole biology. Yes. Just <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's what brings you to that thing. Yes. The second thing is sometimes you're driven by a purpose to change the mindset of people like we had this morning from Elder Kedenda. Leadership is not about just being one of the numbers. You must bring up, you must bring change to bear upon what you want to do. Sure. How do you influence society? So when I went to Nyariba and Masaba as an MP, I was able to completely change the dynamics mm -hmm. how, on how they looked at education. For instance, Nyariba and Masaba used to be number, uh, the last in performance. And, uh, and so my wife and I decided that we would become mentors for teachers. So we took them for an outing in Nekuru, if you can remember. Teachers? The, teachers, in yes. In the entire constituency? Yeah, the, that place. On your and team? to just tell them what they can do to improve the standards of people. Prof, prof you took One them, of the schools. You took them on your bill or CDF? No, no. no. <laughs> That, that time, I want, I want to stand. that time, stand that time, there was no CDF. Yes. On on, a, on my bill. Yeah. So we had, we had a great weekend there. And you know, after that, one of the schools, uh, Moi High School Gesusu. Mm -hmm. After that, they have never looked back. Mm -hmm. They were able to go forward. And we influence all the other schools around mm. to be performing well. Wow. And we must be, a lot of graduates, including some of you who must be here, mm. who have gone through those schools. They, they are here. They are here. Yes. Please give a round of applause to Pro. Um, and so, in, in short, it's, it's not wrong to venture into politics, even for the young professionals. Not at all. But of course, with a, a purpose, I mean, it will be purposely driven Yes. So that you know why you're going in. Mokai will tell us why you went in. All right, allow me to take questions. Please give a round of applause to my panelists one more time. <coughs> like I told you, they are quite rich in content. We may not be able to exhaust what they carried for us today all because of the time limit. But allow me to get into the audience. I have some few minutes. 
I want to pick questions to men and two ladies, and I'll close it up. So let me pick a hand at the back. That's for a man. There is a lady here. Uh, okay, Mokaya, President Mokaya is here. So another lady, yes, I have another lady there. So I'm having two ladies, you, you. Let's start with the, the gentleman. Please mention the panelists you are directing your question to. Uh, we will note it down and then we're going to answer them all at once. Please. Thank you. My you name introduce is, yourself first. Thank you. My name is Jared Okoth, uh, a young profession. Uh, I run a cleaning company. The first uh, question to Professor Marion. A young girl, age six, seven, eight, nine, ten, has gone through FGM. And then the, the, the family keeps quiet with that information until this young girl goes into marriage. And then the effect, the negative effect of FGM starts creeping in into the marriage. What, do you have, what, do you, what are your advices to this family? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question to uh, Professor Sam Mongeri. I wish I could shake your hand, but I know I'll do that before I leave. <laughs> the question is... Um, in the, in, the, in, in the service, how do you protect young professions who are doing uh, businesses, they don't have much, from, from uh, old men um, uh, uh, or uh, big men in the, in the, in the same uh, in the same industry mm -hmm. who has money to give out to get a tender. How do you protect young professional? Thank you. Okay. It's about tender. Thank you. Thank you so much, my brother. I hope you've noted it. Oh, Prof. Dintia is actually talking of how do we protect the young entrepreneurs, even in tenderization, like uh, from, the from people man. who have money to spare to give out. Thank you. You're talking about China Square. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, that's one. Let me go to. Uh, there was a hand there. Where, yeah, there's a hand there. That lady there. Let me pick from uh, Miss Abebe, I suppose. Yes. Good afternoon. Afternoon. My question is. Introduce uh, yourself first, kindly. My name is uh, Mona Abebe. Uh, it is really nice to be um, with you and learning from very seasoned professionals and people who have taken, done, like had the initiative to really serve. Um, we really appreciate the work that you've done. My question is in line with Health of Nations, the book. Are there, is there a way we can be a bit more aware of, oh, okay. Is there a way we can be a lot more aware of the medicine that is in the Kenyan market that might not be entirely safe for consumption? Uh, um, and how do us. we go about that? Yeah, she's uh, asking that how would you be aware of unsafe medicine entering the market? I hope I've paraphrased it correctly. Yes, safe entering the market. How would you be aware? Thank you. Let me pick from, there was a, yeah, you, yeah. Praise God. Uh, my name is Selvia Yugi, a uh, development practitioner from uh, Nairobi East uh, SDA Church. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for such a timely discussion and sharing of experience that you've shared. My question and comment is directed to Professor Ongeri. Uh, it is really interesting just to listen to your story because I'm a key beneficiary of Juakali. It has mm. made me who I am to date. I didn't know the background that much, though we use session paper, uh, session paper one for 1988. I also participated as a lead marketer in Juakali Nguvukazi, mm. by then the first ever exhibition. Wow. I had an experience or incident where being the chair, I had to manage the money that was going out, uh, especially when we went for a selection uh, in various sites. And when it came to accounting, I was really shocked. And by then, I was very naive. I was less than 30 years by then, uh, when I was told that there was an envelope for the director. There was also one for the PS. 
And I stood firm. I said, no, this cannot happen. They never went to the field. And I was taken aside. I was so down naive are you. This is how the government works. Mm -hmm. And I used my ways I navigated through. It worked. But for young professionals who are here, how could they navigate mm -hmm. such scenarios far much better based on your experience because you've been there before? Thank you. Thank you so much. How could the young professionals navigate um, scenarios like corruption within government offices? You know, she's actually a beneficiary of the Juakali um, project that you have, and she's very much grateful. But how do you navigate court battles and all that? All right. And finally, from... All right. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, my name is Alvin Mokaya, uh, born again and a member of this church. I take pride in being a follower of Jesus Christ. That is what is most important. But there is that burning desire in me to make change. For me, I've not been scared of uh, concentrating on a small thing so that I venture into politics. I've ventured into politics as early as uh, 2017 uh, when I was ready to become the president of the Republic of Kenya. Uh, because of lack of finances, my name did not get to the ballot, but I managed to launch a presidential manifesto. Come 2022, I, got, I threw my hat in the ring under the Usawa Kwawate party. I launched my manifesto. I did a smart campaign as an aspirant for Senate seat in the Nyamira County, and I went all the way to the ballot. Votes were not enough. So, God willing, I will try again next time. What do you mean votes were not enough? <laughs> in politics, Prof, look, look at. <laughs> in politics, as Prof will tell you, there is no number one, or number two, or number three. It yeah. is either you are number one or you are not there. Okay. So, votes were not enough, and uh, the senior counsel, which whom I respect so much, uh, Okongo yeah. Mogeni, became the senator. Thank so, you. we will allow him to serve and hand over the mantle go, to go us to in the right of question. time. Yeah. So my question is this to Professor Marion Mtugi, mm. and I can attest to your wisdom. I have learned a lot from your presentation. My question is, in your opening remarks, you talked about um, LGBTQ being an ethical question. It is a burning issue in our country. The Supreme Court has had a say on it. The President has had a say on it. Parliament is having a say on it. We are at a crossroads on this issue. And the church has to have a definite say on it so that the country can have a definite direction. So what would, you, what would be your direction as a professional and as a member of the Adventist Church? Thank you. To my senior uh, professor, uh, thank you for your kind words of wisdom. And I, 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 I would like to know... Um, and I really, <laughs> I'm astounded. I'm, I, I didn't know that that CV of yours is that long. I always follow you. I always salute you. But really, hearts off and hearts off. So Thank God you. continue blessing you and giving you more wisdom as you uh, mentor us. But I, I, I meant to challenge you uh, if it's in your, uh, if, 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 if you can find it fit to just spare some time and mentor some of us. Mm. We really look forward to, to becoming uh, as you have become. So it's like a request. It's not even like a yeah. question. It's like, how can you mentor some of us who are willing to be mentored so that we can be able to uh, take that mantle that you, you maybe want to hand to the next generation? Because some people, some wise men say that uh, the success of your successor determines your success. Thank you, so thank you've you. been there. We want to know where to go. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Alvin. Thank you so much. Um, I want us to, because time is far much spent, actually our time is done, allow me to give uh, Professor Marion uh, to start. Uh, thank so. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, if you could summarize in three minutes, and then I'll give Prof three minutes, we'll really appreciate. Thank you very much. Don't worry. <laughs> I also ran for parliament in 2007, and the full votes were not enough. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, organizers, you can't put me with politicians here. So, um, 
<laughs> I want to say the question of FGM. Uh -huh. That's a very good example of something that is illegal but ethical. Illegal means that the law says it is not correct and actually prescribes what will happen if you do it. But among some communities, it is ethical, meaning they consider it good, they consider it uh, uh, acceptable in some communities. So let's separate between law and ethics. FGM is a very good example. Now the FGM story is long, but the long and the short is that this is a supply and demand kind of thing. If you interview the communities who still practice, and let us be honest, even in this church, mm. they are there. Let's be honest. Mm. If you interview them, it's the women, the mothers like me who say, no, 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 I must take my daughter through FGM so that she can, be, she can get a good husband, she can be accepted. So it is a supply and demand kind of thing that we, we are supplying for the demand of young men. So in our heads, we have decided or we have been brought to decide that you and married young men want girls who have gone through FGM. And so we are providing. So one, if a girl has gone through FGM, she's a victim. If you end up marrying her and you didn't know she had gone through FGM, she's a victim. So she's not to be blamed, she's to be pitied. It's like marrying me who had broken my leg. I mean, it is not my fault. But for the young men, this FGM thing, in my view, should be men-driven. Men should come out and say, look here, we want to marry girls who have not gone through FGM. Then that, we break that supply-demand relationship. Is it clear? And it has worked in some countries. They have done that kind of approach among the Maasai's in Tanzania, and it pays dividends. So please don't harass the victims. Don't target the mothers. We mothers, we are just doing what we believe you young men want, although illegal. Putting it in the law helps and it doesn't help because it just takes it under. And safe medicine, there is good research practice. The practice of drug development is well documented, internationally accepted. And if that process goes through, by the time the drug is released to the public, it has been shown to be safe in the country of development. And as it comes into our country, there are mechanisms, including CABs, including labs, that ensure that it has happened and that has happened. But the truth of the matter is it corrupts societies like ours. There are drugs that get into the country which have bypassed those systems. There are drugs actually that are in some countries that are corrupt, that are not registered in their country of origin. But they come to us. So, but this is a corruption thing, but also drug companies are very, very clear on this. Because when drug companies are taken to court over this kind of drugs, those, countries, those companies go bust. You, you can read, among other things, in that book we have written, the case that the uh, professor knows well, very well, thalidomide, the thalidomide story. The company went bust. So that is what happened. LGBTQ, it's a long story. The law simply says, that men, people are supposed to marry people of the opposite sex. There is a law against indecent acts against nature. That is the law. In terms of human rights, my role as a commissioner of the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, and by the way, that's not an NGO. That is a government institution, commission, it's called Chapter 15 Commission and Independent Offices where we report up to the UN. We are supposed to monitor and audit 
that human rights are upheld in this country and that they are not violated and to promote. From that point of view, we are saying that people of LGBTQ are human because we protect human rights. We don't protect rights of men, women, children. We protect the rights of? Human beings. Please, I'm a teacher. The rights of? And these people are human. So we will protect their rights. If they have done something that is wrong, let the law take its course. Let them be taken to court. Let them be imprisoned. They have access to justice. Let us not go and frog match them and kill them and stigmatize them because they are human. That is from my professional point of view. From my Christian point of view. As a deaconess. As a deaconess. <laughs> The Bible says, go forth and multiply. Now, I am not yet informed of how two men can go forth and multiply, or how two women can go forth and multiply. I am a geneticist, and the basics in genetics is perpetuation of the species. I don't know how two men can reproduce, and how two women can reproduce, but I'm avoiding the question. <laughs> Prof, you've answered it. I am avoiding the question because <laughs> what we have today, I believe, is a red herring. A red herring is a digression, something to remove ourselves from the issues at hand. LGBTQ people have been here, will continue to be here, because from a scientific point of view, we cannot explain it. It is not hormonal. It is not genetic. It is not, people say it is psychological. Nobody can tell you where it comes from. We also know even when you look at cows, a female cow tries to mount a female cow. Is it homosexual? No. All we are saying, I believe that it is a red herring to distract us. We as Seventh-day Adventists should remember that whether you are male, female, LGBTQ, or X, Y, and Z, you have a soul to be saved. Number two, that Jesus did not discriminate even the worst in society at that time, who are the leprous. He acknowledged them. Whether they go, there are more sins in this church and in the church I go to beyond LGBTQ. There are people here who are sleeping with people who are not their husbands, right here in this church. There are people here who are stealing money, even from the church or from where they are working. So this is a red herring. As Seventh-day Adventists, let us be focused to the real issue. And the real issue is preparing ourselves for the coming of Jesus and helping others prepare them for that. Wow. Thank you, thank you, Prof. <laughs> I, I, didn't know, I didn't know you were also a preacher. Uh, I preach in we, this we church almost, severally. We almost shouted, preach it, preach it. But, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank I you almost so made an altar call. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof, a few questions were raised to you. I want you to answer them. Entrepreneurship. Because, yeah. Uh, there was an entrepreneurship. How uh, to protect. Tender and, of course, the protection from the big man syndrome. There was also um, about nurturing the young politicians. Yes. Yes. Well, on question of uh, entrepreneurship and tendering, there are no more laws that govern the procurement in all ministries, whether in government or in parastatal. Is known as the Procurement Act. Then there is also an act which governs, governs the, prof, the, the finances. How government or county governments are able to handle their finances. It's also known as Financial Act, uh, the uh, PMA, uh, PFMA. And there is also the Audit Act. When it comes to business, every government officer 
whoever is in the parastato must follow the procurement rules. If he does not follow the procurement rules, you are at liberty to raise an objection and a panel that will listen to this. If you happen to be one of those entrepreneurs who has also became, become innovative and you have developed innovations, then as I said earlier, you can actually patent your innovations so they are protected from these unscrupulous people who want to feed on other people's sweat. So you have an avenue of raising your complaints when the procurement goes sour. If you have your own innovations, you have an avenue through which you can patent your own innovations. And that's why we encourage. And that's why I brought the bill in Parliament on these uh, patent rights. And the reason I brought it when I was then the Minister for Technical Training and Applied Technology, we had the Kyondo, the Kikuyu Kyondo, which was being marketed by women and other people worldwide. And when they went to international markets, they found this Kyondo had been patented in Japan. In Japan. And yet this was a product of Kenya. So we suffered the first casualty where we are the original jurisdiction of the patency, we lost it out. So today, in this country, there are enough laws that govern mm -hmm. that intellectual property rights, patent rights. There are many. Thank you. Then the question of uh, mentorship, uh, uh, corruption. First of all, it's not a sin to go to politics. Not at all. Daniel was in politics. Joseph was in politics. Many other people were in politics. But it's a sin to edify corruption. And let me tell you, I can assure you, try to be corrupt. You lose all that money in the course of time. It will not hold. It's better to eat what you have, be principled, don't try and take what is not yours. Many times, I and my wife, sometimes have wondered, after we've given everything out, sometimes we've wondered how we're going to live next week. And God always provides. Amen. Amen. One area I want to encourage you. Be faithful in your tithing. It looks small, however small it may be. You will never want in your pocket. You will never want in your pocket. You will never feel the pinch. The more you give, the more you find in your pocket. Sure. You become stingy, the more stingy it becomes. <laughs> all right. Finally, mentorship, I'm willing to mentor you mm. all the time, so long as you accept one principle. In politics, there are times you win, there are times you lose. Even when I go out for competition, in politics, my favorite verse I quote is uh, always uh, Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7, particularly verse 7. It's God who wills and brings one up and brings another one down. 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 Once you accept that principle, like when you went and lost, I've lost several times also, but I was never discouraged. 
I said, it's not God's time for me to be in power. And when God's time came, I was surely in power. And he gave me a lot of opportunities. So I acknowledge in that verse, it's always a perfect verse. Wow. And finally, remember, whatever you do, if you do it diligently and honestly, then you can claim Isaiah 26 verse 3, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in him. Amen. Amen. Please, let's give a round of applause to our panelists today. I hope we have gotten all the benefits you wanted. I want to say one statement. Please, please. I just, in a statement, uh, my panelists, so that we close this down, Professor Marion. Thank you. I just wanted to say, to reiterate, mm -hmm. that even in public service, they are looking for honest people. Mm. They are looking for corrupt people, and they are looking for honest people. <laughs> I was involved in a national exercise. And I went to a person who was up there and says, Marion, I want you to do X, Y, Z, and here is the money. I looked at him, I said, sorry, I cannot do it. He looked at me, he said, <coughs> I always knew women are stupid, but I never thought I would see a Kikuyu educated stupid woman. <laughs> and I walked out. <laughs> a year later, I was appointed to sit on the selection panel of IEBC. It said President Kibaki has appointed Professor Marion Mutugi. I never met Kibaki, I didn't know him. I ended up there, but I wanted to ask how did I get there? I was told that President Kibaki was sitting with a few people and this man who had said stupid Kikuyu woman was one of them. And Pre President Kibaki said, I want you to give me the name of one woman who is brave, not corruptible. Give me that name. And this man who had called me stupid says, I know one. <laughs> so, so, please be clear on what you can do and what you cannot do. The government, the public service, the private sector is looking for corrupt people to do their corrupt work. But there are times that they are looking for honest people who are straight as a die, who can be depended on to do what is right, and it shall be you. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Please, a round of on, on mentorship, on mentorship, I have three mentors. One is a relative who is older than me, and I tell him everything because I know he will tell me the truth. He knows me enough. The other one is my age mate who talks to me at my level. One is professional, he's younger than me. A mentor is a person who, will, who knows you enough to be able to tell you the truth without fear or favor or risk of losing your relationship. I have mentored and I mentor people but please, a mentor is not job hunting. There are people who say, I want you, professor, to be my mentor, but what they mean is that I want you to get me a job. So be clear on what you want when you are seeking a mentor. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Round of applause, please. Thank you so much, um, Professor Marion. We are so pleased to be associated with you. We are happy as a church and as young professionals here in church to have invited you and you accepting to be here with us. I know you had a busy schedule, actually, uh, she flew in at around 11 in the morning just for this conference. Asante sana, may God bless you so much. Um, my left, of course, we have our seasoned elder politician and, of course, a public servant, Professor Sam Ongeri. He's one guy we look up to. You come to church during camp meeting weeks, he's always there, the first one for devotion, and you're like, I think he has a lot in his hands, but he has spared time to serve God faithfully, and to be faithful even in church. You hear his projects and what he has done, the church is mentioned as key. Prof, may God bless you so much. We really wish you well, and we keep praying for you. Are, are you vying in 2027? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you. Leaving it to God. May God bless you all. Nice to meet you. Hope to see you again in the next convention. 
the organizers. May God bless you so much, and thank you for inviting us over. Be blessed.